2019. So, we've got lots of new faces this year, which is awesome, but it does mean that we need to explain what's going on. So, we're about, we have 11 wonderful Lightning Talk speakers this evening. Um, while they are setting up, I will be blithering from the front of the stage, hopefully for very short amounts of time, because the AV system is all working. Um, but, before we get started, Lightning Talks are five-minute talks on any topic that takes your fancy. Um, we will have a different selection each day, as I mentioned this morning. So if you would like to um, give a lightning talk, if you're inspired by this evening's lightning talks, please write up an index card and put it in one of the buckets by the registration desk. I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but while we are here, so these talks are restricted to five minutes. Most of the speakers are excellent and, and keep it to below five minutes because we have 11 speakers in one hour. Um, if they get to the end of their allotted time, we all need to make a noise to indicate to them that they're basically at their last sentence or whatever. So if that's happening, I will step onto the stage around here, um, and I will start to do this. So can everybody tap their fingers together like this, please? So it makes a slightly weird noise, and it's very distracting to the speaker. And so hopefully it distracts them from speaking, and, <laughs> and they stop speaking. Um, so after they finish their two sentences or so, or so, I will start to clap very loudly, and I would like everybody to clap along with me, because that's how we thank the speaker for putting together a talk and entertaining us for a maximum of five minutes. So can we have a practice of a big round of applause, please? Thank you. But, but because this is PyCon UK and we are the best audience in the world, we don't just clap enthusiastically, especially like that. We also make whooping and stomping noises. So, can I get everybody in the room to practice whooping, clapping, and stomping at the same time? It's not that difficult. So, one, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> that is the kind of thank you that, <laughs> that I think we are all looking for. So, without any further ado, um, Gail Wallace is going to talk to us about max credibility. Max credibility. Take it away, Gail. <laughs> no, don't stop yet. So, one of the nice things about coming to a conference, I think, is the pro tips so you can pick up some people. So, I'm hoping I can pass on a pro tip to you tonight. Um, hopefully, I'm credible as a pro. I have two bachelor's degrees. I have a doctorate. I'm now I've worked out in my fourth decade in the industry. But I may have a credibility problem. So, here's a quote on Twitter from another woman. Um, who used to go to meetings with a client who ignored everything that she said. Everything came out of her mouth. So, she said, I got myself a dude as a front man. He went in there with notes, said all the stuff that she wanted to say, client took it seriously. So, it's a, it's a credibility issue for me, right? I have, I have experience, not quite as extreme as that, but similar things. A guy popped up on this thread and said, well, at least I know I have a fallback career as beard candy for talented women who have to work with idiots. <laughs> And yeah, but I want to deprive him of a job. So, to improve my credibility, I... <laughs> I am now an industry greybeard. So, as this pro with this great credibility, I'd like to share with you my fantastic Python tip. My pro Python tip, which I thought was so good that I shared it on Twitter, was if you want to find the larger of two numbers, use max, and not like I did on that day, min. OK, this is the kind of gem you come to a conference for. But this is a community, right? We have a fantastic community. Turned out, an awful lot of guys with beards had better ideas than this. So, Tom suggested this one. Um, Tom suggested this one. Rob came up with a much simpler solution. <laughs> um, turns out, this doesn't apply just in Python, so I've presented this material also at a C++ conference. It applies in quite a few, quite a few languages, right? This is, this is transferable knowledge you're getting here. So, again, let's make it not too complicated. Let's think about those future maintainers. I mean, you're here still hearing out the tests. Make it easy for other people to deal with. But the ultimate one, guy with no beard at this point. So, dear Max, I hope all is well with you. I've enclosed, enclosed two numbers for your attention. I'd be most grateful if you could return the greater of the two. Yours sincerely, Gail. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. Oh, I'm loving that noise. We love enthusiasm here. So, <laughs> sorry. While Dan sets up, um, I just want to set some more ground rules. So, um, we only make enthusiastic noises here. So, if anybody refers to another programming language that you don't like, and I don't know why you'd have opinions about other programming languages, we don't, we don't, make, we don't go ooh or boo or anything like that. We go woo because other people from other communities are coming to our Python conferences and talking to us, and this is awesome. Thank you. The only thing you're allowed to make negative noises at are the terrible jokes that I'm going to tell later on <laughs> in between these talks. But it looks like I don't, have, don't quite have time for one of those yet. Can you tell them if you want? When is a tractor not a tractor? <clears throat> when it turns into a barn. <laughs> That's the noise. You're allowed to make that noise, but only to me, only when I tell those jokes. <clears throat> Okay, so no, Dan. Yeah, wait, 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 oh, wait, 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 wait. What wait. Do we, oh, I see we've got blinking lights. Got my, it's my timer. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. Um, so, Daniel is going to talk to us about NumPy for graphics. Quick round of applause, please. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Dan. My day job um, is as a kind of platform engineer, and so I have very little idea about the kind of data science stuff. Um, but recently, I've been, I, I discovered NumPy, and it's amazing. Um, and I wanted to share with you some of the things that NumPy can do um, and encourage you to, to try NumPy for yourself. Is that... Big, uh... Yeah? OK. Uh, my image is going to be a certain size, which may not fit on the screen. So we'll see how well this goes. Um, OK, so I wanted to create Instagram-like image filters using NumPy. Um, and it turns out it's really easy to do. Uh, if you use Pillow, uh, you can uh, load an image just like that. Um, and uh, Jupyter Notebook knows how to display it. So this is a, a photo I took of Portobello Road. Can I make that bigger? Yeah, OK, Portobello Road Market. Um, it's not amazing. Uh, but if you import NumPy, you can turn it into an array just like that. Uh, so you pass the image into MP array and you get an array. Um, and that is an array of the pixels uh, height times width times three components, RGB. Uh, to get back from that to an image, uh, you just pass, you pass the array into image from array, but um, it needs to be turned back into bytes. So that's a function. Right, so the first thing about this image is it's a little bit underexposed. Uh, and to fix that, you can gamma correct it. And gamma correcting is just raising to a power. So if I raise to a power less than one, uh, I get a slightly brighter image. Uh, another thing that uh, you could do, uh, in, in, all, lots of the Instagram filters are based on uh, slight color tweaks. So if you define a matrix, and I created this matrix by starting with an identity and then just tweaking some numbers. So you build a matrix, uh, and then you just do a matrix multiply, and we have an operator for that in Python, like that. So I get kind of slightly yellower image, slightly kind of funky, but mostly the same. And the next trick I can do um, is uh, this um, NP indices will give me the coordinates of uh, each pixel on the screen, uh, and then I can find their distance from the center. So CXUI is the center, Hypot gives you the distance. Um, oh, let's still run that. Uh, and so that's the distance from the center, scaled to one is the, the corner. Um, and so that's, that's a cone, effectively. I can create that, turn that into a bit of a dome, and then multiply that for the image. And in that much code, I've got like a cool Instagram-like filter, and my photo is improved immensely. So. OK, better do, okay, better do this, this part faster. I'm going to try, uh, whoa. How do I? Out of this, yeah, 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 yeah. No. Okay. Uh, so another thing you do is if you have coordinates, I have a set of coordinates there. They're two D coordinates. I can plot them. It looks like that. Um, if you convert them to homogeneous coordinates, that's adding an extra column of ones. Then you can use a matrix to multiply their positions, and you can do 
all kinds of transformations. You can move those on the screen. And also, uh, a NumPy array is a buffer, which means you can just get the bytes out of it and pass them to something like OpenGL. I'm going to skip over this, uh, because what I've done is turn that into a game framework. Um, and so this is uh, a NumPy-based game framework with uh, loads of NumPy uh, and an OpenGL library called ModernGL. And I've got particles that are all done in NumPy. And I've got shaders that are doing uh, the nice light glow effect here. Um, and uh, this is a project that I've just started. Uh, it's not on PyPI yet, but I'm going to be sprinting on it um, during the sprints on Tuesday. Thank you. Very cool. Very cool. That could have been called Photoshop for the algorithmically minded. Um, so Dustin, you're next. Do I have Dustin here? Uh, not getting any indications that we have. So um, Noel? Okay. Awesome. If you could just set up. Uh, so who's heard of the Pac-Man rule? I've heard people mention it already. Oh, that's only a tiny handful. Education is required. So the natural way to stand when you're talking to the, the lovely new friends that you've met at PyCon UK uh, is in a circle, often, um, so especially if you've got three or more people. Uh, but this is, this is not optimal for building a cohesive community, because it means that the people around, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have slides. Right, in that case, I will stop talking right now, and I will come back in a maximum of five minutes. So Noel is going to be talking. Um, wait, wait, wait. Ooh. I'm just giving Noel a nice background. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Noel is giving a talk called um, ASMR, ASMR for Devs. Take yeah, it away. Um, so here are some positive affirmations for programmers that I think you all might be able to use. So. You will update a package and nothing will break. There will be no conflicts when you commit to master. <laughs> the documentation you are given is clear, thorough, up-to-date, and well-maintained. <laughs> uh, your manager understands and appreciates what you've been doing all week. No relatives will ever ask you to fix their computer. <laughs> there are no technical difficulties during your presentation. <laughs> your credibility isn't questioned. <laughs> that is the sound of your team respecting your focus while you work. <laughs> During code review, you are told there are no bugs. When you demo your product, the specifications have not changed at the last minute. Everyone is appreciative and does not complain about the features they asked for. No friends or acquaintances ever tries to get you to build a website for them because they understand you are not a web developer. <laughs> Everyone assumes you know what you're talking about and respects each other's intelligence. The meeting does not run past. The meeting is exactly as long as it needed to be. Everyone tries turning it off and on again before asking for your help. You fix all the typos in your mock asserts, and all the tests still pass. <laughs> Not only do your parents understand the difference between software engineering and IT, they understand neither are what you do. <laughs> you receive a notification from your CI Slack integration, letting you know everything ran smoothly this morning. You find someone sitting in your chair as you get to your desk. When they leave, they have not changed the height or rake. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 
your laptop battery lasts through the entire conference. <laughs> and when you return from the conference, you're immediately reimbursed for your expenses. <laughs> Thank you. I feel so good now. And every laptop worked instantly when it was plugged into the projector. <laughs> so while Fur is setting up, I will finish talking about the Pac-Man rule. So we don't like circles. Standing in circles is exclusionary to the people outside. So people are new here and don't necessarily know anybody else here, but would like to meet other people in our community. And the way that we welcome them into our groups is that when we're talking to a group of people that we know, we leave a gap. And anybody is free to fill that gap. They can, they can just come in and stand and listen, or they can, if they enjoy the conversation, and they can walk away again if they like, or they can join the conversation. This is how we, we build a community where we know more people. You don't see it there. OK, so are you ready? Ferro is going to talk about Python for Good at the Office of National Statistics. A quick round of applause, please. <laughs> so many of you. Hello, PyCon. So I'm Ferro, and I work in the Office of Financial Statistics as a data scientist. And I would like to talk to you about how we use Python there for public good. So briefly about ONS first. Uh, what we actually do, or who we are, we are UK's largest independent producer of official statistics. And what this essentially means, we're kind of building a picture of what UK society looks like. And it's not just any kind of picture, but a picture that's uh, supposed to be reliable, objective, and unbiased, so that nobody's really left behind from this picture. Now, where are we? Well, right now we are in Cardiff uh, City Hall, but a few miles down the road in Newport, which is the neighboring town, uh, there's about 2,000 people working in ONS Newport. There's about 1,000 more people working in Titchfield, around Southampton, and 100 more people in London as well. So it's quite a big organization. And what's the perks? Because you know, most of you probably have jobs which have really nice perks, like swimming pools and free champagne, and we don't have that in ONS. <laughs> but what we do have instead is really nice work-life balance, for example and flexible working hours, which is, to me, the best possible perk, really, uh, that Champagne can replace. And uh, work variety is really good as well. You get to work with all kinds of data sets and all kinds of technologies and all kinds of other government departments. There's really a ver high variety of work that you get to do, especially as a data scientist. And I think this is a big one for me, a sense of fulfillment, because you, what you actually do is contributing to that. Uh, even if it's just a drop of water in that big sea of employees, you're still contributing to um, some public good eventually, building a better, a more accurate picture of UK society. We um, are sent to all kinds of trainings and courses as well, and even conferences such as PyCon, for example, and last but not least, we have really nice, lovely rabbits that are merrily hopping around the campus in Newport, and that's the perk you probably don't have in any other company. Okay, so how do we actually use Python in ONS? Well, actually, who else is from ONS here in the audience right now? Can you raise your hand just to... That's not too many people. Who works in civil service? Okay, a few more hands, good. Right, um, just to get an idea, uh, what, how do we actually then use Python? Well, one of the ways we use them is to automate things, automate processes. So instead of uh, having a bunch of Excel spreadsheets, then you need to copy, around, copy data from one Excel spreadsheet to another Excel spreadsheet, and it's kind of error prone and not reproducible, and it's, um, it's just frustrating, takes lots of time. Instead, now there's a big push to implement some Python machines where you just press the button and bam, a few seconds later, you have a full publication-ready table and statistics at the other end. Uh, data science, like I said, is kind of a big one. It's really expanding at the moment as well. Uh, we use really all kinds of tools and technologies from the Python toolkit when it comes to data science and really very varied work as well. It's a bit of a well, weird image there. Um, but for example, just to give you an uh, 
kind of a taster what the work involves. Um, predicting GDP using traffic flows of uh, highways in England, or detecting caravan parks on satellite imagery, or outlier detection to quality assure some data sets. It's just the really tip of the iceberg of what we do. And other than that, all kinds of other uh, packages and modules from Python ecosystem as well. So for example, Django and Flask is used uh, for electronic questionnaires, uh, which is kind of eventually replace paper questionnaires. Uh, such also WT forms are used uh, in there. Scrapey is used, uh, used to web scrape some new data sets um, when it's obviously uh, conforming to our web scraping policy. And uh, PySpark is used to uh, manipulate big data that we now store in our ONS data platform. So it's really across the whole Python ecosystem, the tools that we use. So to kind of sum up, if you don't guess it from these pictures, I think our work makes a difference. It's cool, and we use Python. Thank you. Cool. Always good to see Python in the wild. Um, so to uh, finish off, you leave a gap in your conversation to allow people to join your conversation. It was the first group I found myself in this morning. Um, somebody, somebody at some point said, Pac-Man rule, and everybody just spread apart. We just left a couple of gaps. Do you need slides? I do need slides. Give us All a second. Right. Um, and then if somebody does join, you leave another gap. But you know who we were leaving that gap for? It was you, any one of you. So if you see a gap in a conversation, join it. People won't complain. They're not allowed to. I said so. So I think Alex is ready. Alex is going to give a talk entitled, A Robot Stole My Job. Take it away. Thank you very much, Mark. We've talked a lot in the last few years about how robots are going to slowly automate the world. They're going to have self-driving cars. They're going to replace warehouses. Um, but I'm here to bring you the news that now robot automation is actually serious because it came from my job. A little bit of context. I work on, a pipe, I work on an open source library called Hypothesis, which is a very cool property-based testing library. This is not a talk about Hypothesis, but come and talk to me or David about it afterwards, and we will give you the sales pitch for it. One of the cool things we do have on Hypothesis, though, is some really nice release automation. So if a contributor writes a patch to Hypothesis, we ask them to include a, change lo a release note in their pull request. When the pull request is merged, this change log, which tells us whether it's a patch, a minor, or a major release, we automatically bump the version number, add this entry to the change log, push a new tag to GitHub, push a new release to PyPI, and that all happens automatically in about 15 to 20 minutes. And that's all obviously really nice. It means that patches go up very quickly. We're not waiting for releases. And if you're a new contributor, it means that 20 minutes after we've said your pull request is cool, you've got a new release on GitHub. You've got a new release on PyPI even. So that's really nice. And David wrote this build automation about a year and a half ago or so, and it's been running ever since fantastic. We've got hundreds of releases with it. And when I saw it, it was sort of like handing a small child a hammer, which as the parents in the room will know is excellent parenting advice. <laughs> Giving a small child a hammer means they will find lots of exciting and imaginative uses for hammers that we, as boring, stodgy grown-ups, would not have thought of. So I started applying release automation to everything. The ability to make robots write code for me. This is brilliant, right? So I started doing, obviously, auto-releasing other things. So not just Python modules, but Terraform modules and Scala libraries and Java apps. I start, my entire blog is managed using automatic releasing. And perhaps the most fun one for me was code formatting. Uh, there was a talk about code formatting earlier. We talked about you know, using tools like Black or GoFormat to, to automatically format your code. But really, why make a human do it when we can make a, make a computer do it? So we now have a thing that runs on our repos at work that when you open a pull request, if there are any formatting changes to be made, it automatically pushes a commit that has that has also formatting applied. And this is nice because it means we don't have to worry about that. It means there are never any nitpicks about formatting in code review because it's all just done for us. This is really nice. And again, I wrote this shortly after David did the hypothesis auto-releasing. I turned it on, on. It was all really nice. It was all wonderful. Time passes. Empires rise and fall. Python still does not support braces. And 
many, and, and you know, this code runs for months and it continues to accumulate commits on our repo and gradually in the background it becomes the highest committed to our repository. And it also becomes the, th it also becomes the one person who has touched every file in the repository because at every point we edit it, it auto formats it, it's now committed to that file. This is all happening in the background and it's fine, I don't really think about it. What I also didn't think about was the fact that in the git config for this robot, I would put in a name and email address because you have to do that in git. And because I was unimaginative, I put in a descriptive name that I would know what the commits were. And I put in a real email address that happens to address our, our team group address. You can email that address. Please don't email that address. <laughs> and so again, right, our robot is over here, accumulated commits with this, and then they're all being pushed to our public GitHub repository, and I'm not really thinking about it. Until one day, we get an email. Dear Travis. We've seen your Scala work on GitHub. <laughs> and we think you'd be a great fit for our social automation <laughs> startup. <laughs> They're not wrong. Admittedly, Travis has a very poor sense of work-life balance, <laughs> never really contributes any new ideas, and hasn't taken a holiday in almost four years. But um, no, you know, this is the sort of thing they would, I think they would really benefit from. The annoying part of this is, obviously they got this by scraping our GitHub repository. Travis got an email. I didn't. <laughs> and in that is how, ultimately, a robot has stolen my job prospects. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So, David, you're up next. Uh, so, I mean, it could have been an automated routine that sent the email. So it could have been a robot offering another robot a job. <laughs> Oh, well, this is nice. <laughs> Excellent. So David is going to give a talk called How to Have Great Conversations. Well, Quick round of applause, please. Uh, Alice, can you reckon it? <laughs> Sorry, one second. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Try it now. OK. Computers break when I touch them. It's a problem. Um, so yes, I'm going to tell you about something I've been doing for almost exactly a year, because I started doing this at the last PyCon UK. Um, which is how to, uh, some tips and tricks that I've been working on for improving conversations and meetings, because meetings are basically conversations but worse. And this can, <laughs> um, and this can help offset some of that. Um, you may have noticed people are, like, there are a lot of bad conversations. People are really bad at having conversations. And as a result, like, we spend a lot of time having really boring ones. This isn't true. People are really good at having conversations because having conversations is incredibly difficult and we somehow manage to do it anyway. And like 95% of what we do in having a conversation, we're actually really good at it because language is basically the foundation of how we think. What people are really bad at is structuring conversations. Um, like what happens is that any given point in the conversation, you're doing about as well as you can, but the overall effect of the conversation tends to become a mess because like no one is making any attempt to like try and make sure you're having the best conversation you could be having. And so in order to try and like balance these two things, um, keep having in conversations as well as we can, but just like try and nudge them in the right direction. Here are just like a couple of really useful lightweight interventions you can do to a conversation or a meeting to just try and make them a bit better. Um, the easiest one is to start using like conches or speaking objects, which is you just have something that's sort of like about phone size, probably don't use your phone, but like I usually normally use a deck of cards, I've used a Rubik's Cube, and you have to hold it in order to speak. And when you're done speaking, you put it in the middle, Nobody snatches it, you just pause for a moment, and the next person who wants to speak then reaches out and picks it up. And this stops people talking over each other and generally hugely improves the flow of conversation. Uh, conversations are often, no, don't have to be about things, but it often helps if they're about things. And it helps if people know what the conversation is about. This is particularly important for meetings, but like it even works, works normally. You just say, let's talk about such and such, let's um, and 
just having that as a focus point for your conversation really imp um, improves it. And if it's a meeting, it will work wonders because pointless meetings are the worst. Um, and use topic timers. Uh, topic timers are like lightning talks for conversations. You take a timer that runs for five minutes, and when the five-minute timer is up, you do a check-in and you say, is this what we still want to be talking about? Or should we focus in? Should we switch subjects? Um, just having that five-minute rule just like instantly levels up all of your conversations. Um, here's one. Um, some people talk a lot. You might have noticed this. Most people who talk a lot are not bad people. They're actually just nervous, and they would be delighted if you were to help them do conversation flow control and basically say, hey, you're talking a lot. Can you calm down? And um, as long as you agree in this advance, waving at them when they do this is not rude. They will actually be delighted for it. And just having an agreement up front that like, when someone's being dominated in conversation, people just start waving at them. Um, it makes everything flow wonderfully. Um, I've yeah, so there are a couple of like more hard, heavy, hard, but heavyweight things you can do. So formal structures that will achieve a bit of a more serious work uh, change to how you have these conversations. There's a general thing called liberating structures, which sounds like a cult and isn't. It's just a management discipline, which is like a cult, but people pay more money. Um, and liberating structures are basically just like an assembly of different lightweight interventions, which um, let you run a meeting for a particular goal in a particular way. They're just really assemblages of the things that I've been talking about and a few others. Um, and check, the, check them out. Some of them are really useful. Some of them I haven't seen be useful yet, but are probably useful in the right setting. Um, and I also do a thing called TikTok, which is basically um, a structured discussion format for having uh, going through a whole bunch of topics really quickly. And I started developing it at the last PyCon UK, which is why I've been doing all this for exactly a year. Um, and I will probably be running um, a TikTok session on Tuesday during the sprints if any of you feel more like a brisk walk than a sprint, which I know I do at the end um, of, no, of conferences. And that's all I have to say for now. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! Come on! There we go. Um, so, Chuck, are you around? Oh, awesome. Uh, and then Rob will be next. Is Rob? Oh. Okay. Um, so, one of the ways, again, that we reinforce our community and make it sustainable is, uh, I mean, I've been talking about helping introduce newcomers to our social groups, um, but also our professional groups. So we want to hear from newcomers to this community. So it's one of the things that I maybe didn't make clear when I was talking about the two-bucket system for the lightning talks this morning was that we, we have two buckets to encourage new speakers to speak. So if you put your card into the new speaker bucket, and it's a self-evaluating thing, so maybe you've given some talks inside your company or something like that. Um, it's, it's not that you've never spoken from a stage before or spoken in front of people. Um, but if you decide you're a new speaker and you put your card in that bucket, that is prioritized. We want to see you up on this stage. Um, yeah. It's, it's the people who have been here for years and give more or less the same lightning talk every year. They're the ones that need to beg me to get up on this stage. That's why we're curating their talks. So Chuck is ready now. Um, so she's going to talk about running an open source project like a startup. Can I have a quick round of applause, please? Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about running an open source project, which is just like running a startup just you won't get paid and you won't earn money. Um, so I didn't have my own startup, but I just tried to have my open source project because I just feel jealous and I want to try it. So that's my motivation. Um, so yeah, like months ago, I created this um, library called Pick and Mix. So it's actually on PyPI, yay. And um, yeah, also it, it comes with the documentation, which I use Cookie Cutter for. So um, this is very easy. Even you don't need, even need to think about it. So it's a machine learning um, thing. So uh, it's basically doing stacking, if you know uh, machine learning. So it use um, scikit-learn and then models that you put them together and you can, you can train, train it. And um, yeah, so it's, well, like many startups, uh, my project may not be successful, <laughs> um, but um, I would tell you my journey of doing it. So um, first of all, if you want to start a project, you want, need to have a good idea to start with. So um, 
I, I still don't, sh I'm not sure whether if, if my um, idea is a good idea, but, um, but I think uh, it would be useful to have a tool that help you to do some machine learning, you know, without doing it again and again, you know, similar things every time. So I think like, okay, maybe I could do something like that. Um, and also, like running a startup, you have to work around the clock. So like the time that I usually work on my project will be after work, going to a place with a beer at my hand and drinking, sipping away and working on it. So it's kind of like, you know, I've, I used to work in a startup before. So every Friday they hand out some free beer uh, and have, have a meeting. So it's like, okay, beer and work. It, it, it works, okay. Um, so also, uh, you have to have people to contribute because like, I can never do things all by myself. For example, uh, like the, the logo you see before, I didn't design it and somebody very nice that uh, she, he or she, or they, I, I don't know, but like uh, we only you know, exchange emails, but uh, that person helped me to design it. So um, also I have three contributors so far. I'm so proud. Um, <laughs> so you have to really get people involved. It's like for a startup, you have to raise money, right? You have to raise the funding. You have to you know, share, like tell people your ideas and proposal and get people to contribute by giving you money. But uh, for open source project, maybe money is not, you know, everybody would give you, but uh, you can start getting people to contribute to it. So I run some, um, you know, um, sprints in London. So our one meetup that we had, I have people who, you know, sit around the table and then start making some contribution. Everybody's happy, even the contributors, they're happy because I take care of them. So. <laughs> Yeah. Also, oh, uh, one thing, if you have uh, seen me earlier today, you may see me like handing out stickers. So I do have stickers um, that uh, for the, like uh, with the logo. So uh, come talk to me, you will have a sticker. And then we did some sticker exchange downstairs earlier. So um, people do make stickers for their project and I'm really inspired. So I have one as well. Um, yeah, and the eye catching logo. Again, thanks for the designer who donated the logo for me. Uh, also, again, you have to do a lot of promotion. I'm doing it right now, give a live stream talk, and then it's like avocado work that you have to um, really uh, you know, spread the words, tell people about it, so people get interested. So if you want to contribute, talk to me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my uh, live stream talk. It's very fast, but um, stickers, come, come find me. <laughs> Thank you, Chip. Rob. So after Rob, we've got Gil. You ready? Awesome. Not quite yet. Um, yeah, new speakers. And you're probably, um, if, if you're not an experienced speaker, you're probably thinking, I really, you know, I don't want to go and speak. Or maybe I, you don't know enough about something, you're not an expert in a topic. And, and that really isn't a limitation. What we want up here is passion. We, we, people will learn things that they didn't know before. There are other people that aren't experts in the thing that you know something about. So please come and tell us what you love. Tell us about your favorite library. Tell us, tell us about your favorite um, service. Tell us about something nice that happened to you at work. Tell us about how to electrocute people and get away with it. That's a title from last year. Um, talk about uh, lightning jets. That was a cool topic, too. Um, yeah, anything that you're passionate about, we want to see that on the stage. So please put in a proposal tomorrow. Um, we, yeah. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I have no idea how to do this. Just make, just make it mirror the screen. So, um, another rule for um, helping integrate with other people at the conference is, so we have a divide between the people who have been here before and know people. Okay. Okay, in that case, I will stop blithering for the moment, um, and Rob is going to give a talk which I've lost the card for. So if you would like to introduce your own talk, I'm terribly sorry, quick round of applause, please. <laughs> Hello, PyCon. I'm thrilled to be back. This talk is called Fantastic Bots and Where to Find Them. Uh, it's got nothing to do with what I do for a job, except it's vaguely Python related. So uh, fantastic means two different things. In, in this context, it means really cool bots. Uh, and uh, it also means bots that don't exist yet, which is where I've got all my pictures from. They're from my friend Small Robots on Twitter. So uh, this, uh, this bot here is a small robot called ShyBot, which is very shy. And all these, all these bots are friendly bots. They're not like bots that steal your job. They're uh, real robots, though. 
so there, there are things that, that are, exist in the world and that move around by themselves and maybe do useful things. Uh, so, for example, this raspberry bot uh, likes to find your enemies and blow raspberries at them. Uh, and uh, this pi bot here is extremely useful if you need to know the decimal places of pi. Uh, but if you put those bots together, you find my friend the Pi Wars bot. And this is, this is what I'm here to talk about because uh, last year I came to this very stage and presented this slide here saying that uh, my new hobby is Pi Wars and it's a really cool thing that I just learned about where you get to build a robot out of a Raspberry Pi and I've decided I'm going to enter it and I'm going to go and, and do it and make a robot and run Python on it and I'll come back next year and tell you all about it. So here I am. I did it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we, we had a wonderful Pi Wars. It was a lot of fun. There were some big robots. There were some small robots. Uh, there were some cute robots. There were some weird robots. Uh, and there was my robot. This is my gorgeous robot. It's called Scarab. You will see it tomorrow. No, not tomorrow. The hardware session, which is Sunday morning. If you come to the, the hardware session, uh, Scarab will be there in person driving around. Uh, it was a really fun thing to build. I hadn't used my hands for ages. Like, it was a whole new skill set doing the engineering stuff and putting it together. Uh, not as hard as you might think because there's a lot of off-the-shelf parts, uh, but uh, it let me stretch my Python a little bit. I'm kind of a DevOpsy guy doing web dev type stuff, so uh, lots of these imports were things that I hadn't really imported before, uh, and it was a lot of fun playing with uh, things like audio and GPIO and the Raspberry Pi camera all that stuff. It's all very easy to learn, very suitable for kids. So this Pi Wars event is a very fun event where uh, anyone can basically build something that they can, they can get working. Schools compete, uh, nerds like me compete, uh, and we have a great time building these things and, and putting them through their paces, doing all kinds of challenges. Uh, so I, I also, I liked it so much, I organized this mini conference, which is happening in October, which is, again, inspired by PyCon. Uh, that's been a fantastic experience. I'd love to talk to anyone about organizing a conference. Uh, almost sold out. If you want one of the last seven tickets, ticket sales close tomorrow. Uh, and uh, Pi Wars itself is coming back to Cambridge. So this is where to find them, Cambridge. You can find our mini conference there, and you can find Pi Wars itself in Cambridge uh, March next year. And you must apply if you want to enter Pi Wars, which you absolutely should, and come and talk to me about it, and I'll tell you more about it. Uh, this year, the theme is going to be disasters. It's disaster area. So your robot might save people from disasters, or it might be a disaster itself. It doesn't matter. It's just disaster themed. It's just a theme. Uh, so this is your deadline to apply. That's the website to look at. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. If you have index cards that are in order, don't shuffle them while you're talking. It's a nervous habit, but it's not one that you want to develop. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I started out speaking about 10 years ago at a Python conference like this um, with a lightning talk. And I was terrified. I mean, I was standing there like this. I really didn't enjoy the experience of being up on stage. But as soon as you get applause at the end, you realize that actually you're among friends. And, this is like this, you, and people come up to you afterwards and talk to you about the thing that you, that you gave a short talk about. So it's a great way to meet new people. So I can't re recommend it enough. Uh, you're doing everything on the con line? I'm just waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, Gil is going to give a talk called Rolling Dice with Python. Quick round of applause, please. Thank you. So this is going to be full-on live demo. So it may fail, but it won't. So rolling dice, right? So how, how would you like, so first of all, who likes board games? Yeah, amazing. So how would you roll a die in Python, right? You would you just from us, yeah. So from random, import, rent, end, and then you just do rent, end, just a normal die, right? So just from one to six, and then you get it, right? This is boring. This is, this is not Pythonic, in my, in my humble opinion. So I tried to fix this by creating a library called Dragon from Dungeons and Dragons. Who likes Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. We're, we're not many, but we are strong. <laughs> so, so, look at, um, so look at this amazing interface. It's very intuitive. Uh, this, is, this is B Python, by the way. It's like better Python, not IPython. 
Um, so we import the dies, uh, the die. So let's say, let's say we get a T6, right? We got a die in our hands. Oh, th th this is this is spoiling too much. So, so like, so to roll the die, I was going to ask you like how to, but B Python is already telling us that there's, this is very simple. You just call it. The result was the same as well. I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> but just to prove that this this is working. <laughs> Randomness, right? So um, now this is. So what if you want two dice, right? Does this work? Oh yeah, it works. <laughs> so those are the results. So wait a minute. What if we want more dice, right? What if we want d8, right? So eight sides. What if we do this? Will it work? That is the question. Oh, not like that. That's fine. Live demos, am I right? Oh, wait, what? Did, did, I, did I do what? Oh, times, yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon. Oh, yeah, you can do that. So um, try dice today or tomorrow. I don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> cool stickers, too. Sorry? I got cool stickers as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, Emmanuel? <laughs> so I didn't think we were going to get through all the talks, but all the talks have been ever so slightly short, which has been fantastic. So we've managed to fit everybody in. Um, yeah. Gil, was some of that code mine? I remember when you launched that on Twitter and we had a little Twitter exchange. So some of that code's mine. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, if you, want to, like, if you want code that works in weird ways, like, I'm the person you need to talk to. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, have you got slides? You don't have slides. See, there's, there's no, ah, oh, I've got to keep it all, I, it's going to be up so quickly. I did. Uh, a tractor was driven into a field and immediately got stuck. It was a magnetic field. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave you to it. Uh, Emmanuel is going to give a talk called How to Quit Your Job Well. A quick round of applause, please. All right, so... Um We've all had to quit our jobs, obviously, and so let's talk a little bit about how to quit jobs. Um, or perhaps, you know, you, you, you may have been forced to, or, you know, let's not talk about that. But let's talk about how to do it, do it well. So, um, in general, if you're, you are well and the job has gone relatively well, then simply don't be an asshole. Um, that's it. That's the end of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you know, take into account how other people are going to feel. Like, try to uh, do a little bit of give, but also remember that you have to have a little bit of take. Like, you are now having to think for yourself. A little bit of selfishness is healthy. When uh, quitting a job, you have to think of your own career and where you want to go. Ultimately, the more fulfilled you are, the more you'll be able to bring to the sector and other future jobs. Okay, however, things are not so easy uh, when you've been suffering from something. So like say you've been burnt out or you've been depressed. And it's even worse if you started the job with burnout and then it's not going well. All right, so what do you do then? Um, so this is what I want to talk about. Um, so when, when should you, so first thing, when should you quit? There are a couple of reasons. Uh, obviously, bad team, bad culture. We have all heard of those ones. Um, when, wh one thing that we don't talk about so much is when you don't want to do the job. And this is something that we don't think about very much. Um, if you reflect on the last three months, six months, a year, and you just realize that you can't really see yourself getting happier doing this thing, and it's already not going well, then you should really consider you know, just uh, cutting the ties. Um, so again, a little bit of selfishness is healthy, so please remember that. Uh, the problem when you are suffering from a mental health problem is that it's very hard to tell 
whether you dislike the job and are therefore unhappy or whether you're just unhappy in general all of the time and therefore that's why you should quit. So it's very difficult to uh, find that balance. So what can we do uh, in order to try to cope with this? So severing a connection, if you think about it, severing any kind of human connection, be it friendship or uh, a professional connection or other types of connections requires clarity and purpose. And when you're in a bad state, clarity and purpose are exactly the things that you don't have a lot of. So um, before you decide to issue notice, if you're like, at the point of already like, oh, I just can't take it anymore, take a break. Right, they typically forget about that anyway, but take a break specifically, take a holiday uh, specifically before telling uh, your workplace that you're going to quit. You are probably going to, be, to get clarity that way, or at least a little bit, try to get to um, a little bit more of a balanced place. Now, you may not be able to get to a more balanced place. Maybe you're just not in a state where you can achieve tranquility, and maybe even going on holiday doesn't help you. you know, maybe you don't need a week or two. Maybe you feel like you need six months off the sector, right? but you can't afford that. So in that case, own it, right? own your impulses. You are going to be emotional and impulsive for a while. Let them lead you to your next thing. It's enough to know just a little bit of what your next job should be or what uh, draws you. To the back to the field, like well, you know, why do you want a computer anymore? Um, just own that and continue uh, working with that desire. Uh, follow it; it will lead you to unusual places. Uh, more practically, admit mistakes openly and clearly to your colleagues. If you so vulnerability is a position of strength in general. It is hard to do, and it is harder to do if you're a, from a minority demographic. Um, but be as vulnerable as you feel you can be. Um, be cautious. That if people don't like it when you're vulnerable, that is on them. But if things have not been going well already and um, you don't see hope for it improving, I mean, you, know, it, you just have to pull the plug. Be open about the mistakes that you've made. Um, you know, Say, tell to them a little bit about um, the future course you're going to take. People will generally be pretty understanding of your needs. Uh, talk to others. Uh, community slacks, Twitter, use your support network. Now, at that point is the time to do that. Um, if you need to quit a job where your references will be bad, that's a little uh, practical tip. Seek support from your network. Um, Try it for a change of role. Uh, that might help you with whatever problem you're facing. Just changing the everyday job might help you. And also possibly try contracting um, because, to be honest, they just don't check references that much. <laughs> All right, that's me. Uh, good luck if you're in a bad spot, OK? Oh, that was a pretty heartfelt talk from Emmanuel Rice, some good advice. Um, so unfortunately, that was our last speaker of the day. Um, we've had 10 wonderful speakers. Can I get a big round of applause, please? <laughs> Woo! So we need more submissions tomorrow before lunchtime. We need more um, new speakers to submit talks tomorrow. Um, I have been Mark Smith, and I will see you tomorrow at 5.30. Good night. <laughs>